So yes, once you've got your property, there, there are so many different things you need to look into as a landlord, and often it's going to be specific to the kind of property you've got, the kind of tenants that you're letting to, and the kind of agreement that you're letting on. So just this is literally going to whiz through to dazzle you a little bit with all the stuff that you need to bear in mind. You've got safety regulations as a landlord, your legal obligations, energy performance certificate, your gas regulations, you've got to have your gas safety check. PAT is portable appliance testing for small appliances, so if you're providing things like toasters, microwaves, kettles, every single year, they need to be tested, um, or do like I do with my humans. Um, electricity checks, fire regs, heating, building regs, all of these are going to be probably specific to the kind of property, and also to a certain extent to your local council. So these are all things you're going to have to obtain local specialist advice on, really, to make sure you're doing them right. Insurance, <coughs> landlord's insurance, as you know from Sarah Beanie's adverts, is very specific to landlords. It's not the same thing as your residential insurance. And it covers all these kinds of things. Um, employer's liability insurance, that's one that a lot of people sort of don't consider um, as well. But if you've got a property that you're maintaining, you're sending cleaners in, that you're sending contractors in to, um, uh, to, re to do repairs and what have you, you need some liability insurance in case anything goes wrong there. Um, tenant's contents insurance, mostly is down to them. Rent guarantee insurance, these are kind of things Paul's going to come on and mention as well that he offers. All sorts of different insurances. Advertising the property, this is fairly obvious stuff. Obviously, you need to work out what kind of let you're doing. Um, these are all the different types of lets and the types of tenants that you might consider letting to. Um, and again, the legals are going to be slightly different for each of those cases. Where your advertising is going to be slightly different as well, depending on the kind of tenant that you're going to attract. And also, there isn't a sort of blanket solution that works across the country. You will find different things work in different areas. Even where I am in Poole and Bournemouth, um, if you're in Bournemouth, advertising in the local paper, the Daily Echo, gets you those attorney inquiries. In Poole, actually, no, it's websites. And they're, they're practically linked together. So you need to make sure that when you're doing your research, it is very specific, and ask people within the local area what it is that works best there. Getting the right tenant. This is always a tricky one. Um, you know, you have to accept that you're going to get a dodgy tenant. You just are. There is no way around it at some point. These are things that you can do to be as sure as you possibly can be that you're not going to get a dodgy tenant. Um, gut instinct, I think, is a big one. I actually, running HMOs and just renting rooms to people, um, I don't reference them. There's absolutely no point. They're not there for long enough, to be honest with you. Take a, a month's rent up front, and then you eyeball them. It kind of works <laughs> most of the time. You get a very good feeling, and if your gut feeling says no, don't take them. End of story. Um, bank statements the past three months, and employer's reference is a useful one, whatever, and that's, that's one that probably is of all the references, a good one to have. Previous landlords references, they're happy to give it to you, and clearly if they've uh, trashed the place, they're not going to give you the details, they're going to make up some story and how you approve it. Um, proof of address, credit referencing, you can go through credit referencing agencies, or if you're using an agent, they will have their own um, credit reference company that they use. Okay, things like copying passport or driving license just is quite useful particularly if you're renting to people that aren't nationals of this country. It's always useful to have something on record. Um, and guarantors, if you are using a guarantor, um, it's a good idea to do a land registry check. Check if they own their own property. Because otherwise, half the time, you can get people guaranteeing, and actually there's very little point if it came down to it. Soon. And national insurance numbers are also something that's good to have. And then when you're actually showing your property, if you're doing it yourself, um, just things that you need to have to have, being able to state the rent monthly or weekly. A lot, tenants tend to either work in one or the other. If you can't very quickly do a conversion or know off the top of your head what your rent is, they can be a bit confusing. Um, deposit, minimum five weeks, I take a month. Less than two months, somewhere between a month and two months rent as a deposit. Um, and no, just know things like the bills, the council tax, nearest transport links. Um, it's quite good as well if you've got a property to do a little information file. I don't know if any of you do that, just for some local places and take rooms and that sort of stuff. Um, and be very clear on any restrictions as well. And what I think is quite a good idea, but it's, it's usually in the contract anyway, but I tend to have another piece of paper that I actually get them to sign on sort of house rules. So it really is very clear that I've kind of got it in triplicate uh, and what furnishings and fittings are included. Um, so before you move them in, really make sure you're happy that they are the right kind of person. Make sure you're happy with the references, you vibe with them, you're okay to move them in. Um, the deposit option as well, um, you've got to if you're on an AST, um, have your deposit held in either the government deposit collection scheme or in an insurance-based scheme. Who, just out of interest, who uses the actual DPS and who uses the insurance? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. 
there's a, there's a big debate on which one's better, but you've got to do one of them. Uh, make sure you've got tenancy agreements ready. And then on the day, you've got your inventory check-in, you've got to take your meter readings, uh, reiterate to your tenants exactly what the rules and regs are on it, and make sure contact numbers and people are clear in terms of, if there is a problem with X, who do you contact? So you might have a good contract or a good handyman on the site, you say, listen, if there's a problem with your electrics or your plumbing, ring them direct, they're my guys and they'll sort it out for you, uh, and your own contact details. And who's managing the let? This is the big thing. Do you let them yourself, or do you actually put it out to an agency? Or do you put it out to a private property manager? I think, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where ultimately, put a value on your time. This is the most important thing I would say with buy to let, which not enough people do. They say, well, I'm saving money because I'm managing it myself. Yeah, but are you? Because how much, what could you do? What's your hourly rate? And nine times out of 10, all these people are actually losing money because they don't bill for their own time. <coughs> I think they're saving, but it's a false economy. Also, you know, people like Evan Cube, like Paul, the landlord action, you know, these are people who are professionals. They are dealing with this every single day. And things that will take you a very long time to work out or to sort out, they can do very, very quickly. And actually, when you work it out, as we were saying earlier, you know, 10%, 60 quid a month on average, what's that for the peace of mind? And it's tax deductible. <clears throat> and it's tax yeah. deductible as well. That's another thing you're asking. If you're a 40% tax there, that's a big amount of money. It'd be tough. To, and they take all the legal responsibility. Yeah, that is a big yeah. thing. Don't tell that to, to sell it, letting agents. It's just because most of us don't think of it in that way, and we should. I disagree they don't take legal responsibility because if they go bust, you're the one who has to put the deposit back and they have to protect it. Which is why you're researching agents. That's, that's why you've got to go to the That's why we're saying if well, you go yeah, with a regulated yeah. agent, yeah. you don't have that problem. Yeah. Agents aren't all regulated and they can run off with your money to Spain and have done. So unless you go with an agent that is regulated and you check that they are regulated, that they are all or now, yeah. then you are in, you are in trouble. So all or now are the ones who are letting agents. Yeah. In your, you know this stuff more than anybody else in the country, let alone this room. So anything else you want to add on that? No, I mean the gentleman's just highlighted a point that is a problem with one of the insurance backed tenancy deposit schemes. If the agent <coughs> has disappeared with it, that they do come back to the agent, and to the landlord, the other scheme doesn't, and neither does the custodial scheme. So just think about what is going to be your cheapest option. Cheap is not necessarily based. Um, we just ask which scheme will go after the landlord in that instance. <laughs> My deposits. Well, the gentleman said that, so that I'm not I self-manage, so I'm not going to run off with my own money, am I? But, no, but, and if I have, but if the agent does, <laughs> yeah. if you've been using an agent, and that's where your deposit was protected, because you'd want to hold it, they then pursue the uh, landlord. I've, I've seen it, many, many complaints, and my landlord's calling me up. When you check the name of the as well, just a bit of personal research, will, are they happy to give you details of other landlords that they've been managing so you can actually take some personal references? And how many properties do they manage? See how focused they're going to be on guaranteeing that you've got tenants. Because that's one of the sort of common complaints. So it's worthwhile just sit down and have a very honest conversation with them. Because um, the last thing you want is, is, is some sort of agent that's, and again, the good ones won't, but there are agents that are more motivated to fill some properties than others. Um, and then your suppliers, once, once you've got the property up and running, you're going to have um, uh, the agents themselves, your accountant that's running yours, you've got a plumber and electrician and one job man, uh, and people to do emergency repairs. There's a big sort of portfolio of people you're dealing with when you become a landlord, and you have to make sure that you, know, you, can, you can manage those people effectively, and that you have the right relationship with them, so that they're going to do what you need them to do when you need them to do it. And always, 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 you better pay on time. These people are particularly those last four. They're the people you're going to phone up and go, I need you now. Now, what's going to make them drop everything and come? If you pay them on time and sling them a bottle of whiskey at Christmas and give them a Kit Kat when they're doing their work. It sounds silly. <laughs> I do it. And it you works. Kit Kats or Snickers? <laughs> Which is great. The hobnob is quite a good thing. <laughs> I do like the hobnob, I have to be honest. Kit Kats go down very well. Cup of tea and a Kit Kat. Big smile on their face. Oh, that's the first one I've been offered today. Brilliant. They're going to take your phone call. Um, uh, where are we? I'm going to do the summary in there. Um, challenges, yeah, I won't do the summary yet. Uh, these are all things Paul's going to come to talk about. This is what can happen. You've got getting into the property if there's an issue or if you need to do a periodical check when you do it. What happens if the tenant refuses access? 
What if they get into rent arrears? What if there's damage to the property? Unauthorised subletting, that's, a, that's quite a problem actually. Um, nuisance that they might be causing and genuine criminal activity. These are all things that tenants can do. And how do you then deal with those? Which is going to lead us on nicely to um, Paul's section.